Uh, let me welcome all of you to chat with Matt. The purpose of chat with Matt is to find speakers with something interesting to say. I like having conversations with people, as I hope all of you do. Uh, tonight's guest is Beth Carter. Uh, Beth is somebody who is very well known to me and should be very well known to all of you because she's written about 150 articles for our newsletter. Uh, she's gone through the alphabet at least twice. Am I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's three times. Uh, three times, I know. And it's been all great stuff. So uh, my practice is that uh, I ask my um, guest speakers to uh, introduce themselves because when I've been introduced, people usually butcher it. So I'm assuming Beth will do a much better job of introducing yourself than I could ever do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beth and then we're gonna have a great conversation about interviewing. Well, Beth, welcome to chat with Matt. Okay, well, thank you for having me, Matt. I, I do like seeing you more in person, but that's okay. I, that's the beauty of Zoom. Uh, well, unfortunately, we can't go to Tavern on Main anymore because it closed. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no, that's what I said. Ah, oh, geez. So um, just for all of you, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in Westchester County in Bronxville, but I lived in Fairfield, Connecticut for 23 years and moved to Rhode Island eight years ago. So that's how Matt and I know each other. Um, I actually did attend Feng meetings in person, although the last time I did drive down from Rhode Island uh, to, to be part of it. So it, I, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, please do ask questions. This isn't about me, this is about you. And I've been in your shoes. I got laid off twice in 1991. If you remember correctly, the economy was pretty lousy back then. And so, but just a little bit about me. Um, I am, I'm actually an alum of two of the big four public accounting firms. I was with KPMG and their executive search practice until they shut the practice down. And then I went over to Ward Howell for a year, which at the time was one of the largest executive search firms in the world. And they imploded at the beginning of, well, they imploded pretty much in 91, and that's why I left. And then I joined Ernst & Young uh, in their executive search group, and they shut the practice down. So that's how I ended up twice being laid off in 1991. And then I started my own company. Uh, Carter Consultants is an executive search firm. Uh, we do work globally. We work on a different model, though. We work on a per hour basis. So search firms subcontract out to us, and then we also have our own corporate clients. And, you know, I've done work uh, really across the whole country, but also across the world. We've done work for the United Nations and ICF, or, uh, IFC, excuse me, the World Bank is among some of our international clients. Um, I've pivoted to some extent. Um, I also own Beth Carter Enterprises. Uh, I'm a certified executive business and career coach, and I've been doing a lot of corporate trainings, uh, both for um, organizations um, and uh, nonprofits and Fortune 500 companies. And then my last, well, I actually have two more titles. My, two of my, my one other title is I'm an adjunct professor. Right now I teach at Bryant University, which is my alma mater, uh, but I also teach at Roger Williams University. And I also teach through their corporate training departments as well as Bristol Community College. And then last but not least, I am the executive director of the Rhode Island Business Competition uh, which is a part-time role running a small nonprofit. Uh, we award cash and prizes to entrepreneurs and right, we're right in the middle of judging right now. So I do wear a lot of hats. I would say the bulk of my work is coaching and corporate training. And so anyway, but needless to say, um, I know a lot about what's going on in the, in the world of search as well. So. Yeah, you I, seem to know it from every angle. That, that's, what I, that's what I've always enjoyed when we have these conversations. You've not only uh, been a recruiter, but you've also coached people. And you've, as a professor, uh, you're really into the teaching part of it, which is what everybody, every, every good boss does is a t they're, they're a teacher. Very true, actually. We were talking about that in one of the corporate trainings yesterday. But the nice thing working with um, college students and most of my students are seniors is you know helping them get into the work world too, but also talking to older people about the fact that you might be interviewed or managed by a younger generation. So it's good to have that perspective of all the different generations. So I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, we, we can, uh, if, if we have time at the end, we can talk about the words you're not supposed to use, like back in the day, <laughs> things like that. 
My, my mother's favorite word is dungarees. I keep telling her, you don't wear dungarees, mom. <laughs> Or she says, I'm really mod. I'm like, get rid of that, mom. <laughs> In and of itself, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, you're right. Beth, you're right. I, 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 my grandchildren tease me because I still call it suntan lotion. Yes. <laughs> yes very true. I get punished for that all the time. But the thing is, is that um, in terms of emotional intelligence and interviewing, you know, it does go hand in hand. But the thing is, is that I think a lot of people have a misperception on what exactly emotional intelligence is. So, you know, think about this question. Um, did you ever know someone who just didn't get it? Um, did you ever know someone that's, you know, said the thing at the wrong time? Could be you too. Um, or did you miss cues at like a party, a meeting or an interview? That's all deals with emotional intelligence. And the thing is, is we need to be very attuned to who we are. And a lot of people think emotional intelligence is just about self-awareness. And it's true. The best leaders are the most self-aware. I mean, this has been proven, but that's only a piece of it. It's great that you know that you blow up if something happens or you cry or you're very calm or whatever, but you also have to know how to control and manage those emotions. And that's what's critical, especially in an interview. Um, the first thing I always tell people is identify your triggers. You know, what is it that sets you off? So in my case, I'll be very honest, I can't stand whining, drives me nuts. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard. I can feel my body tense and I get very like anxious and just can't wait to let stop listening to it. There might be certain words like, you know, we were talking about generational, but there might be even certain words or phrases that just get you going in one way or another. And, you know, hopefully in an interview situation, you wouldn't have anything that would trigger you, but you just never know. So just spending that time, you know, reflecting on who you are and how your emotions are and how do you manage and control them is critical. So yeah, going back I think to, to pick up on your point, there's, there's a lot of people today who have a chip on their shoulder over lots of things. And if you use the wrong words, you can set them off. Exactly right. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but, you know, like back six months ago, you know, people would ask if you're Republican, uh, you know, Democrat, independent, right? And that could set somebody off. Now the joke is, right, is it Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J, &J, right? So you try to lighten up the mood a little bit. But again, it, we, we are so overly politically correct, too, that sometimes, you know, what we think is good is fine. But it's the emotions, it's the way you react. So the thing is, I just want to go back to the gentleman that talked about his interview before we started. You know, I was listening to you and the first thing that came to my mind was actually that the person you were interviewing with emotional intelligence wise, I think is pretty low. And the reason why I say that is, is that a good interview is 50-50, meaning you ask 50% of the questions and they ask 50% of the questions. Um, I, I didn't mention, but I, you know, Matt mentioned I'm a blogger, but I also co-authored a book. And I did it with a dating coach. And what it was, was about how dating and recruiting are very much alike. So in an interview, just like think about a first date, you know, you're trying to gather information. You know, is this the right partner for me? Is this the right position for me? And as you go through more dates or more meetings, you're, you're gathering more data, but also you're picking up on cues. You know, does the person eat with their mouth full as an example, or does someone you know, interrupt in an interview, or do they not pay attention to you? Things along those lines. So there's a lot of parallels to the two, but that gentleman um, that you interviewed with, to be honest with you, it screamed lazy in terms of that you had to do all the questions. Yes, you should have questions, no doubt about it, but it should be more of a balanced um, interview. So that was just my two cents on that. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, you know, you, know, I, you bring up a good point. I, I try to tell people, I have a search practice too, as you know, and I try to tell people who are interviewing that they have, to, they do have to be information gathering. That, that, uh, there's a sales term called growing up on the customer where you have so much product knowledge, uh, you just start dumping, you don't ask questions, you don't know what you're selling into, you're just dumping. And a lot of people are not listening and doing this information gathering during an interview. So the thing is, is that there's a lot of reasons why some people might have higher emotional intelligence than, than others. And mm -hmm. it's 
first with, again, that self-awareness. But the thing is, we're moving at 150 miles per hour, right? And part of it is the fact our attention span is really short because of this. Think about just the Super Bowl commercial. Back five years ago, the Super Bowl commercial was 60 seconds. Now it's 30 seconds at $5.6 million. But if you go on YouTube, the average commercial is five, 10, maybe 15 seconds. So our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. I mean, I always say the best commercial out there is the pistachio nut commercial because they do like 20 seconds, then you jump to another commercial and then they reinforce it by having another 20 second commercial after that. But the thing is because our attention spans are so short and we have so much coming into us that we don't take the time to be present. So I'm doing a bunch of corporate trainings for a bank right now. And yesterday morning I said, you know, I called on people and I said, what'd you think about in the shower? And people were like, oh, what I'm gonna eat for breakfast. My daughter's flight's gonna be late because of the weather and all this, oh, your training I was thinking about. And I'm like, there's an awful lot of people in that shower with you, including myself. Like it's a really bad visual. And I was trying to get people to think about, you know, you go out and you buy shampoo that smells like coconut or whatever, but do you really smell it? You know, when you're in the shower, do you feel it in your hair? Like, are you present? And so the best leaders and the best interviewees and the best interviewers are ones that are totally 100% present because how can you pick up on other people's cues, right? How they behave if you are not 100% present. Now being granted, I have been on the other side of the table as I've said, you know, it's hard because we recognize the fact that you might be a little nervous or you're used to doing phone interviews. And now of course we're on to Zoom. I always said I would quit the search business when people had to see me every time for an interview. But then you have the in-person, right? So there's all different levels of interviewing. There's also, you know, back in the day, uh, they might have like a teeny little screen and six people would be on the other side. Or you have six people on your side and you're all, you know, getting asked questions and here's your competitors right in front of you. So it's the way you handle all these things, these things, but if you are not 100% present, you're not gonna even know, like with that gentleman who had that thing, how do you ask the next question if you're not really paying attention, not to just what the person's saying, but how they're acting, inflection, um, tone of voice, body language. I mean, if you look at a pie chart, words is a very small part of communication. The rest of it is, is all the other things. So people with high emotional intelligence pick up on all of that. Even something as a slight eye roll. Now, if you have teenagers, you get the big eye roll. But if you have, but if you're in an interview, you may even get a slight eye roll or yeah. looking away for a second or something like that. I, I think Zoom is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, for, uh, for people who were previously enduring telephone screens uh, to do a Zoom interview, you have all these visual cues. I will counter that though. I tend to like still do phone interviews and I'll tell you why. I, oh. take a lot of, I take a lot of notes, so it's just me. And that's the thing, you know, that's the, it's a balance too, because if I'm taking a lot of notes, I'm looking down if I'm on a Zoom call. So yes, you're right. You do want to pick up on the visual cues. I just know myself personally, when I do the first round of, of interviews, I like the phone because then I can take all my notes. Second round, that's a different story. But I do agree with you. You can pick up on that. But the thing is, is that, so you're not only being self-aware, you're not only managing and controlling your emotions, but then how do you react to others? So being socially aware. So again, even from the, you know, think about the second you walk in even to the lobby, you know, is the, the receptionist, if you're in person, you know, smiling at you, are you smiling at them? You know, how's your handshake, your eye contact? I mean, these are basic things that we do in res, you know, interviewing 101. But the thing is, we, I don't think we spend enough time really trying to understand, you know, where the other person's coming from. Why, like if you ask a question, like that gentleman asked that question and then they answer and then you ask another one and they're not really participating, you know, is there reasons for that? So it's really interesting to understand. Oh, I see the text things coming up. It's yeah, really- I forgot to put it on. That's okay. Um, it's really interesting to understand 
who is a good interviewer. Now, keep in mind too another thing. If you're interviewing with the hiring manager, what's the likelihood they've been trained to recruit? I mean, I even have a program to train hiring managers to recruit because not that they, yeah. they ask the wrong questions, like the illegal questions, but I got to tell you that still happens. But they ask yeah. other questions that don't really do anything, meaning you want to ask the right questions to get the right candidate. Otherwise, you're calling me because it's not working out and either you're outplacing them or they're being coached or they have to have additional training. So you want to ask the right questions to begin with. And so it, it, but the thing is most, most hiring managers don't know how to recruit. And the thing is they're not picking up necessarily on the cues that you're giving. So it's, it's a balancing act with that. So the thing it's very is- very important to know, to decide up front or the beginning of your interview, whether the person interviewing you knows what they're doing. Right. And sometimes you don't know right away, but you can usually pick up on it pretty quickly. Like that, like I know I keep going back to that gem, gentleman, but it's true. Um, yeah. The other thing is with emotional intelligence is, is empathy. And empathy means putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So think about, you know, like after you're done with the interview, think about, okay, put yourself in the hiring manager's shoes, not the HR person. I'm talking about the hiring manager. Because that may be your job someday. If you get this position and you get promoted, you might be being promoted into that role, right? So think about all the stress and all the, the issues that that person is dealing with. And so if they weren't 100% present when you were having your interview, you know that does raise red flags. Like if your gut's telling you, I'm not really sure this is gonna work, you know, that's why you need to have more interviews. And that's one positive since really since I think the Enron days that you are being asked back for more and more interviews. But then again, you can make sure that it's a better relationship, a better marriage. You know, I think those are things you have to be watching for. These are people you spend more time with than your family. Exactly right. So the thing is, emotional intelligence is not about IQ. It's not about being smart. Um, it's not about manipulating others either, or even if you're an extrovert versus an introvert. However, someone who has high emotional intelligence will pick up on the way people process information. So as an example, extroverts talk, 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 i.e. me. Um, but introverts need to have that time to process. So if you say something to them, they may pause for a minute to process what you're saying and then respond back. So in an interview, you got to pick up on that pretty quickly because the thing is like me as an extrovert, I don't like silence. Silence makes me very uncomfortable. And so, so if an introvert takes that pause, right? You might be saying, did I say something wrong? Did this happen? What's going on, right? And if your body language is showing that, and they're very perceptive and have high emotional intelligence, they're going to pick up on that. So just keep in mind that let the other person have that pause time. Don't get anxious over it. You know, they might be saying, thinking, wow, you know, that was a really good point. Now, what am I going to do is ask a question back to that. Or maybe I need to explain something about the company or I need to, maybe I didn't explain this well, so I need to talk about it again. So, so be more cognizant of pausing because pausing can make is, is part of communication, but a lot of people don't, it's like, you know, like when the radio stops in the car, like I'm always like pushing the buttons, <laughs> what's going on with the car. Mm -hmm. Even in corporate trainings, I've learned to pause so I can get others to, you know, really think about what I'm saying. So that's someone who has high emotional intelligence recognizes that. I think when you're being interviewed, silence can be very painful, but sometimes you, you have to do it. Right. I mean, I'll give you a good example. My boss, Charlie, when I worked at KPMG was quite the introvert and I was young. I was like 25 years old and we would go into a meeting, you know, and I would bounce from topic to topic to topic and you could just see Charlie's head just spinning. So I learned very quickly that I'd have to say to Charlie, are we done with this topic? Can we move on to the next one? If he said yes, we'd move on. If not, you know, whatever. And, you know, so maybe with the meaning of six topics, I might have to ask that question six to eight times. But I realized it built a better relationship because I was also being respectful of him 
in the sense of understanding that he needed that time. Mm -hmm. So what are the cues you look for? If, if you're on Zoom, what, what are you looking for when you're um, coaching people on how to interview? Well, I think the thing is distractions in and of itself. You know, like on this call, like the room I'm in, I call this my training room. There's no distractions. You know, I don't have my, like I have my phone here just to show, but, but I really try to keep everything away because again, our attention spans are short. So if our phone bings, which is a real problem, you know, mm -hmm. automatically our mind just goes right to it. So putting the phone in the other room is a good example. But if the other person you could tell, and you see it, I mean, I see it with my students too. Like they'll be looking at Zoom and all of a sudden you can kind of see them looking off to the side here and you know darn well that they're looking at something else. The other thing is people, and, and you have to be fair to people too. So not only are hiring managers not trained to recruit potentially, they also don't know how to use Zoom properly. Because really what you're supposed to do on Zoom, and I have a hard time with this, you're supposed to look at the, the camera, which is the dot at the top of your, your screen not looking at yourself or the other people on the call. So that's a little challenging too. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, it's just like what Matt just did. So Matt just nodded his head. So that means he's interested, he's paying attention, good eye contact, things like that. See, but, I fooled you. I'm sorry? I said, see, I fooled you. You fooled me, yes. <laughs> but the thing is, is that a lot of times we are we might be distracted, meaning like we have our papers in front of us, we're trying to ask some questions and all of that. We're also trying to take notes. There's a lot going on. To be honest with you, I'd rather you kind of take your notes after the fact or just write one word down, you know, if you want to follow up with something and really, again, stay present because we, our minds do go off track. The other thing is, is that look at, are they um, the rest of their body language? So just a tip, too on Zoom because we um, because of my role we we do pitches right the entrepreneurs do pitches so I actually had a pitch coach come in to talk to entrepreneurs and he said one of the things with Zoom is is that normally when you talk and you talk with your hands you talk at chest level well you can't see my hands right now so you need to raise your hands up so think about your hands because your hands tell a story as well so that's important that's just a little tip about Zoom. The other thing is, is that ideally you should stand up. Or if you're not going to stand up, what you should do is push your chair back and sit on the edge of the chair. So you see how my back is now straighter. You might not think this has anything to do with emotional intelligence, but again, it's the cues. It's the idea that you've made that effort. And that's what's important with emotional intelligence is, is that you're really trying to get into the mind of the other person and and understand where they're coming from and what they're doing. So if you've yep. got someone interviewing and they're like this, you know, okay, here's, the, you know, ask me the next question, you know, they might not be fully engaged. No, but uh, you know, the advantage of Zoom is that you can see yourself. I think that is a little distracting at times, but uh, it has its advantages that you can actually see how you look and and perhaps gain some understanding of how people are perceiving you. True. And I think as we move forward, you know, a lot of companies are not going to be going back, you know, fully or, and also now if you have work with international divisions, that used to be a phone call and now you'll be doing it via Zoom. So there is definitely a lot of positives to it, but I think Zoom etiquette, you know, and I know that goes back to Peggy's video uh, is very important. But the thing yeah. is, the thing is, is that you want to show the, the one thing you want to show, regardless if it's in person, on the phone, Zoom, is show energy. I mean, I can't tell you how many people who've gotten on the phone and it's like, you know, painful. Um, so really think about the energy. Even if you're kind of low key, there's nothing wrong with being low key, but you're trying to make a point here. And even with Zoom, it just, at, you know, especially if it's an hour long interview, you might feel like your energy levels dropping a little bit. Try to show that that passion, that motivation, that that you're interested. You know, as you can see with my hands, you know that that's important. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to talk with their hands, but I'm just saying to try to make a point a little bit better. So you have to figure out. I would practice, to be honest with you. I would definitely get in front of a mirror, other people, your phone. It doesn't really matter. But you can even record your own Zoom. With right. 
and see how you do. Right, or get a friend to be on the other side and ask questions mm -hmm. because it is a different experience. I've had people who've done extremely well on phone, this is pre-Zoom, done extremely well on phone and then they get into the meeting and they're nervous or whatever and they blow the interview. And then I've had people that like, oh, I'm not really sure I wanna present them, but then I do. And then they get in there and they knock the socks off of the interviewer. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to recognize where you excel at and where you don't. And Zoom, of course, is still new for a lot of us. So we're still playing around with that. Yeah, well, we're still, we're, we're in a Zoom world for at least the next several months. I'm sure we'll branch into in-person someday. Right. So it's here for the moment and we got to get used to it. <laughs> so another thing I want to bring up too is again about staying present is about listening. We are lousy listeners. Okay. I don't care what you say. Most people are not good listeners. And again, it goes back to attention spans and distractions. So as I'm talking and let's say Matt and I are just having a conversation back and forth, Matt may be formulating in his head how he wants to respond back to me. Or maybe he wants to ask me a question. So he's kind of hung up on the question and he's not necessarily listening as well as he could. Another thing that happens, which we saw a lot, I hate to say it at the end of last year into this year is maybe we don't agree with what the other person's saying. And we're really like very adamant about what the other person is saying that we completely shut down. So it's like a wall comes up. Yeah, we had, Peggy and I had a guest speaker uh, on a chat with Matt uh, who was a broadcaster. Um, I can't remember her name just off the top of my head, Rebecca something. But anyway, she, the, when you're broadcasting, one of the things like on CNN, you know, they have to maintain what's called a pleasant face. No matter how outrageous, whatever it is they're being told, they can't react to, in horror. They wouldn't be good form. No, very true. Very true. And that's hard sometimes. It really is. But you know those people that just don't agree with what you're saying and the wall comes down. Yeah. The last, the last thing with listening to I want to mention is, so let's say I, I see David here. So let's say David and I are talking and David happens to mention to me that he's going to go out for pizza tonight. So as he continues talking, I'm like, ooh, pizza sounds like a really great idea. Where can I get pizza tonight? You know, do I need to call ahead? You know, what am I supposed to do? What kind of pizza do I want? Does my son want it? And I got this whole other story going on, right? And the thing is, is that we do it. We don't mean to do it, but we do it. So again, picking up even on that, you know, how many times have you said to someone, could you repeat that? I, you know, I, I'm not sure I, I was paying attention, right? We've heard that. So you would hope that a good interviewer was 100% present, was prepared, you know, knew what they were doing, knew how to recruit. That would be the ideal. And yeah. I don't know, I've never done a study on it, but I question how many people fall into that category. No, for sure. Most people do not do a great job of interviewing. And you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be on your game to make sure what you want covered gets covered. Yes. So you definitely have certain things that you want to make your point across, but then again, how are you going to deliver it? So it's not just what you say, but it's the delivery behind it. I mean, think about anybody you've seen, maybe not necessarily on TV, but maybe a friend or neighbor or family members that just exude not only confidence, but it's just their delivery. Like you want to listen to them because they're just, they have that energy. They have good inflection. They have good eye contact all of that. And if you don't have a good, if you're not good with eye contact, and I'm not talking on Zoom, I'm talking in person. If you're like eye contact is an issue for you, you should know the person's eye color by the end of the interview. Hmm. Because well, there's, that a, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people. I had, I had somebody interviewing. I, I was asked to participate in a group interview with one of my candidates. And uh, when he was thinking, he tended to just look down. You could see he was thinking. So he wasn't looking at the camera. He was deep in thought. Well, I'll be honest with you. Actually, it's funny you say that because I was going to say I had a client that kept looking to the left. That was the big thing, looking to the left. And then I had an executive coach client that every time he talked, he looked up. And I'm like, I stopped him. I said, why do you keep looking up when you talk about your wife? And because he was unemployed at the time, he was downstairs in the house and she was upstairs. 
So every time he talked about her, he looked up because that's where she normally was. And she was putting a lot of pressure on him uh, because he was the one who carried the benefits. So the fact he was unemployed, this was in the height of the recession. So every time he talked about her, he kind of looked up. Um, People play with their hair, people play with their jewelry. You know, if, I know I said about talking with your hands, but if you're the type that kind of plays with things while you're talking, because you're nervous, just clamp your hands in your lap and just be done with it. I mean, it's not the best piece of advice, but I know people that, you know, they, they don't even mean to do it. They, one of my students, like she finished her presentation and she was a nervous wreck during the presentation, did really well, but then she's listening to others and she's twirling her hair and she's doing all kinds of stuff. And it was so distracting to everybody else. So that's the thing is if you have multiple people on the Zoom call, think about, you know, the distractions that others might be doing and it may throw you off on your game. Yep. And you have to be aware on Zoom that people, you may not be talking, and, uh, but people may still be looking at you. Oh, yes, definitely. There's no Especially in a group interview situation. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware that people are still watching you. Right. You pick up your cell phone or maybe you turn to your other screen and look at your email. Uh, not, a, not something you should do. No, definitely not. So we've talked mostly about you and your emotional intelligence and maybe the emotional intelligence of the interviewer. So it's two separate bodies. Mm -hmm. The thing that we should really talk about is emotional intelligence questions that you may get asked because company, okay. companies are, well, I think it's important because I think companies really need to gauge, you know, are these people emotionally intelligent? You know, this is becoming more and more of an issue, especially for all the divisiveness we've had over the past year. Um, you know, people are flying off the handle a lot quicker than they used to, you know, and it's not just because of politics. The pandemic, maybe you have little ones at home and you're trying to balance that and elderly people. Like there's a lot of stressors on all of us today. And the thing is, is that you're in the interview, you're nervous, maybe, or maybe you're not, maybe you're doing fine, but then someone throws a question at you and it totally throws your game off. So how do you, you quickly recover or hopefully never get to that point? So you also have to be careful about, you know, some of the questions you may get asked. So here's, I got a few for you that maybe we could talk about. Um, the first one is, how do you de-stress after a bad day at work? Oh, wow. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if you get asked some of these questions. Five years ago, I don't think Matt and I would even be having this conversation. But I think today's world, I think it, these are questions that will be asked more and more. Would you agree, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, people, people are trying to uh, learn about you. And as we discussed earlier, you should be trying to learn about them too. Yes, very much so. Um, another question is, what's something you've achieved that you're most proud of and why? So a lot of us get, we've been, I mean, I've been asked that question myself. Um, but again, it's your delivery. It's not just what you're saying. You know, like if you're talking about an accomplishment or you got a promotion or, or something. But again, it's the delivery. You know, do you show... Um, yeah, I don't know if I would say glass of wine there, Lisa. Yeah, <laughs> I, I may not say that. Um, you know, I might say I get drunk whenever I have a bad day. I get drunk as a skunk. Oh, I, I stop by. The, I stop by the liquor store on the way home. <laughs> I didn't quite say that. I just, you know, I, no, I don't have to stop by. I got my. I didn't, I didn't say I take it straight out of the bottle and I don't pass go. I don't even get out of the store. But okay. Well, well, I wasn't yeah. Asking the question. I was just curious. No, well, you could have the extra long straw, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, no, but, it, the, but to be honest with you, you had to, to kind of work around that question, you know, like going off the glass one, you could just say, oh, I get together with friends, you know, um, or family. Um, I like my alone time. I go for a walk, you know, something like that. So I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd say kick back with a glass of wine, but I might say, oh, I get together with my friends. I would think that that would be implied that maybe you're having a glass of wine, but uh but anyway, I think what you have to be aware of, uh, and this is on your side, is that everything you say is a story about you. You have to be very careful how you answer any question thrown at you. Right. And I think the thing, too, and it's interesting you mentioned about stories, because 
we re, like when I do my corporate trainings, I tell people, you're not going to remember like this concept over this concept, right? You know, some cost, Mars model, all these don't even know what those are maybe, but you're mm -hmm. not going to remember those. What you're going to remember is the stories. That's what people remember. So as you're, when you answer an interview question, the thing is, if you can tell a story, one, it makes you memorable. Two, if it's got a lot of meaning to it, it's going to come out in your body language, right? It's going to come out in, in the way you deliver it. So think about things like, again, that question about, you know, what you've achieved, you're most proud of, you know, maybe just not just say, oh, I got a promotion, but tell the story behind it, you know, you know, and, and really try to explain, you know, not saying your feelings, but the feeling behind it. You can hear it in people's voices. So really think about the stories because we do remember stories much more so than others. I think it's from our whole upbringing, our grandmother telling us stories and our mother telling us stories, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we, this we, this is how we live, right? We live. Well, we, all remember, we all remember the three little pigs and the wolf coming down, you know, wolf blowing the houses down. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's talk about if, if if you don't mind. Let's talk about the the idea that uh, I I believe all things all stories are a gateway drug. So your ninety second announcement it makes people decide whether they want to continue talking to you. And in the interview, I think you need to be aware the interviewer if they decide they're going to pass you on, they're going to have to tell a story about you. Hmm, good point. Yes. And again, going back to self-awareness, you may, you know, when I, when I was at Bryan, I was a business communications major. And the one thing I remembered about my college degree was this line. There's no such thing as reality. Reality is what you perceive. Thus, your perception of life is your reality. So for argument's sake, let's say Lisa and I go to the movies, right? And we come out and she goes, ah, oh, I love that movie, especially that particular scene. And I say, are you kidding me? I hated that. Couldn't wait to get out of there. And that, and I don't even remember that one scene, right? So again, perception is very important. But this, so when you tell that story, maybe before you tell that story, before you have the interview, is to go to other people that know you and have them describe to you how they see you. And it's very eye-opening to do this exercise because you know I do write resumes as well. And you know, mm -hmm. I tell well, go back because I want three descriptive words about you. And they'll say, oh, I'm caring, I'm whatever, you know, kind of boring words anyway. And so I say, well, go, go talk to people, go talk to people. And they come back and some of them who really do the exercise well, they'll, they'll talk to like 10 people. And it's interesting to hear what people said. Like I've been described as unconventional. Now, I never would have thought of that word, but my friend who's heard me speak many times, she said, you're very unconventional in the way, like the things you do and how I bring things into the trainings and, and, right. and the exercises and all of that, it's unconventional. So I use that as a marketing technique and think about it. You're all in marketing. I know you're all finance people, but technically you're all in marketing and sales. You know, if you think about the old Toys R Us, right? You know, in the doll aisle, the Barbies all had different hair colors and all that stuff. But back in the day, there were only two Ken dolls. There was regular Ken, and then there was what they called Malibu Ken, which was the tan Ken. So if you think of yourself as a product in a box, why is someone going to pull you off the shelf versus someone else? And if they pull you off the shelf and you do well with the first interview, going back to Matt's point, then how is that box going to go to the next person, right? And how are they going to describe you to the other person that's you know, going to be interviewing you? You know, I've done a lot of uh, personal selling over the years and been in two organizations that had very large field sales organizations. And one of the questions I ask uh, people who are presenting themselves in an interview is, what's the sell? What's the sell? What are your three major buy points? That's good. I like and that. Those are things you need to be make you need to make sure you're communicating during your, your interview. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about a couple other questions, but this one I really like, and actually I've just been um, doing this in my trains. How do you celebrate success? And I think that's an important question because it's not always about the money. Mm -hmm. if they've actually proven, there's been studies that, you know, if I call you up and say, hey, I've got this job for you. If you really like your boss, the chances I'm going to pull you out are, are a lot slimmer. 
So that relationship between boss and employee is critical. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, when you're think when you're being asked about your boss, you know, think about how you would describe that person as well. So that's one scenario. But the other thing is about success. What is success to you? Is it really the money and the promotion? Mm -hmm. Is it the fulfilling work? Is it the fact you've trained and mentored others? Going back to Matt's point about teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's all those different things. And that also yeah. into the, the idea of emotional intelligence, because people with high emotional intelligence realize it's not the money. It's all the other things that make you successful. We're, we're, we're getting to a quarter of five and we're certainly open to questions and just uh, put them in the chat box. Uh, I may have you on mute and uh, ask them. Because if you don't ask questions, uh, Beth and I are going to keep talking. So I just want to tell you, I just put in the chat a link. It's a free emotional intelligence test that you can take. Um, people find it very eye-opening. It takes you a whopping like five minutes to do. And it's funny how people, nest, there's three buckets that you'll see when you take, after you take it. And some people say, you know, I disagree at first and this and that. And then they really start to think about it. So you have to reflect. But I strongly suggest you take it. If nothing else, you know, it might be a bit of an eye opener to you. Yeah, I think one of the core things with uh, Myers-Briggs or any of these other tests is to put people in tune with them themselves. It's not that there's any one style that's better than another. It's that you know what style you are. Yes, very much so. I actually, I love DISC. I'm a DISC expert. I love DISC. Um, only because you can take it every nine months. So that's why I like it better than Myers-Briggs. But you're right. I mean, any way to be more self-aware is beneficial. You know, yep. talking to others, taking assessments, any of that stuff. I mean, you know, we I, I do them all the time because it, it, it does help. I mean, things that you may not think about or you've forgotten about yourself too. Um, you could get thrown a question. You're like, oh, I haven't thought about that in a long time. So I highly encourage you you know, to any, if you can get any free assessments or, or any kind of assessments, that's helpful. But again, talking to others, are you talking to your former coworkers, your former boss, have them tell you stories, have them tell you stories about you and see, you know, and get their perception on this. Yeah. And some of this ties back to uh, at some point you'll need a reference from them and you do want to know what they're going to say about you. Yes, that's true too. <laughs> Very uh -huh. true. Very totally true. worthless. Totally worthless. Well, maybe we shouldn't use him as a reference. What do you think? Matt and Beth, <laughs> I've, I've found it helpful to ask my former boss or bosses, hey, what are my, what do you see as my strengths and what do you see as my blind spots? And that blind spot does pull some, pull some things out, whether accurate or inaccurate, but presumably they're very accurate. You can manage to that or at least make sure you you know, that, that old address your blind spots or address your weaknesses as strengths and vice versa. Was there a blind spot comment that uh, caught you by surprise? No, uh, in looking at annual reviews and those kinds of things, things I knew about myself as well, but it was, it, it was good to sort of hear and he might've had a different wrinkle on some of them, uh, mm -hmm. my, my recent boss, but also, answering or making it solidifying your point Matt about hey that gives you an idea of what they might say if somebody asks hey what's what's what what's Will like or what's Matt like or what's Beth like it's it helps mm -hmm. to know their their answer or what they're likely going to say about you if Beth, and when asked people are more concerned today than previously about how you're going to get along with everyone else definitely I think that's, I think that's critical, especially in the environment we're in. You know, we're, we're kind of all in, in a lifeboat and we better get along because the lifeboat's not very big. Well, I think the thing is, is that because a lot of people even are working from home, you miss that water cooler talk that, you know, and, and, oh. or that break room talk. So if the other thing is you walk in on a Monday morning and you're inundated with emails because that's the only way sometimes you can communicate now with people. So mm -hmm. 
there's just so many different stressors on and you know self-care is so important and again people with high emotional intelligence recognize that they actually have to put in their calendar you know they need a time out like i always tell people sitting is the new smoking so get up every hour and, and even <laughs> around the room um that's fine but you need that break because if you keep going 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 you're going to burn yourself out you know your brain's going to burn out just like an engine in the car so there's a question here from Arrest, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It says, if an interviewer gives a visual cue he or she doesn't like or agree with an answer, um, you should, you know, sh should you try to readdress it? I think the thing is, is that you can't be unauthentic, right? If you, you know, if it's something that you firmly believe in, then you have to call a spade a spade. Um, if you feel like you haven't been totally clear, like you haven't really explained yourself well, then I definitely would, would readdress it. So it really depends on the content, context of the question. But I think sometimes, you know, and again, you have to assess after the interview. I know all of you want a job, but I don't want to see you six months again back on this, these calls because you took a job and it wasn't the right job for you. So you really do. And I'll be honest with you, when I joined the search firm, it was a big mistake. And if I had gone with my gut, I was young and stupid, frankly. Um, I never would have joined that company. So you have to do your due diligence too. Yeah. Lisa? I think you, yeah, the, the great lesson of interviewing is you better keep your radar screen on. Because right, right. you, it's, your, it, it's your life. And most people, uh, given the, the job situation, and uh, perhaps uh, our, uh, our group is, of course, uh, older, and maybe there's fewer opportunities coming up. You still need to be aware that um, it could go horribly wrong. And to Beth's point, you don't want to be out looking again because you overlooked something. Definitely, I agree. Lisa, did you have a question? I yeah, do. Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan Roth has a question. On oh, he has a question. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to look at. See, that's the only problem with Zoom. You're looking. Back. That's all right. Um, most people are not good at conducting interviews, so I often feel they need to emphasize what I view as important. Asking how things are going can be hard. Sometimes I can get a sense and other times not. Can you provide some so so thoughts on subtle signs to focus on? Mm -hmm. it's, my question, is it clear what I'm getting at or you want me to? Yep, yeah, no, please uh, clarify. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm a tax professional. I'm either usually inter either my boss will be the uh, CFO if it's a larger uh, company, maybe it'd be number two. But as an example, I had an interview yesterday, a very large company with the CFO. I mean, about a $20 billion company. He would not be my, my boss, but um, it's actually part of succession plan guy, we had pleasant conversation. He didn't ask a lot of questions. So on the one hand, you could say that that's good, but I found it a little bit hard because when people ask you questions and focus on things, you can kind of figure out what's important to them and focus on it. So I and kind of was proactively trying to think of what I thought he might be interested in or emphasizing things from my background, but he was, he was a super nice guy, but I just found him hard to read. So I kind of left it yeah, not knowing well, I think how- I, I, just, Beth, you can comment on this. I, I, I think to a degree, uh, the people in our group do things that lots of people they're interviewing with don't really understand. Yeah, I mean, I Beth, think- you froze, so I don't know if you're still on. Am I on? Probably on my side. Am I frozen? Did you hear my question? Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. Um, I, don't, I mean, some people are hard to read. Some are very good poker players. There's no doubt about it. Um, but maybe throwing a question back at them, you know, playing off of what they're saying, you know, asking them maybe to prioritize is sometimes like if they're talking about this and say, oh, this sounds like this is a very important aspect to the role or the company or whatever. Can you comment further on this? Maybe I would throw it back into their court and see if you can get them to elaborate or something like that. And then try to pick up on like, are they smiling about it? Do they look very serious? You know, whatever it may be. Matt, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a little joke. Uh, how come you always answer a question with a question? And the response is, do I? <laughs> 
So, you know, if somebody asks you a question uh, or if you're going to ask someone a question, I think you have to be very careful that it is something they can answer. You don't want to, you know, what are the three big things that are wrong with the company or that we, we have, you're looking for me to fix? Well, you know, they might not even know. So now you've painted them into a corner. It might be uh, turned uh, to, to your emotional intelligence point. This might not be a good question to ask. Well, I also think sometimes companies are looking for free consulting services. You know, tell me how you would fix this or fix that. And, you know, you're, give, you're providing free consulting services almost. I've seen that happen several times with companies. Sure, but I think you have to take that chance. Uh, my my oh, yeah. has always been that even if I expl totally explained it to somebody, they would still never be able to figure it out. They would just come away with the idea that I knew what I was talking about and they would hire me to do it. Lisa, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, just getting back to your comment a little, both of your comments a little earlier about, you know, everyone getting along and that sort of being, you know, maybe a bigger question today because so much of the world is still going to be in a hybrid or, or a remote circumstance or situation for the next little while. I've taken my career, I spent the first half of my career, probably like a lot of people on this call in, you know, large organizations, large corporates in the $40 billion range. I've spent the second half of my career much more on the flip side of that, which is in small and mid market and now even sort of smaller and earlier stage things. And sort of the corollary to fit side and how do you elegantly ask this is how do you, how do you, how do you handle conflict? Like how does conflict get handled in a small team? And this is both at an executive level and then, or also similar question at a board of directors level, how do you, because, you know, dysfunction in teams, especially in a remote world is so challenging. So how do you effectively try and gauge that when you're speaking with people? Well, first Beth, what, what do you define? Without trying to sound like you're going to be combative, by the way. Yeah, how <laughs> well, would you define conflict? Well, my mother always says to me, I should get along with people. I'm like, my job's not actually necessarily to get along with people by, you know, different people have different perspectives and different ideas. And so, I mean, even if it's just different disagreements in call it priorities, direction, approaches, anything like that, that, that becomes contentious. Yeah. But the thing I teach team building conflict resolution, that's the class actually I teach. It's oh, okay, good. And, you know, we talk about the fact that it's actually, for you. <laughs> um, we talk about the fact, and I do it for corporate trainings too, but we talk about the fact that conflict, actually, you have to have conflict, right? I mean, you, you can't avoid it, first of all. I mean, there are people who do try, but actually there's really, there is functional conflict and then there's dysfunctional conflict. Right. I think if you're trying to find out if it's functional versus dysfunctional, because that's really what your question is. It's not that how do you define conflict or is there conflict, but what kind of conflict, right? Would you agree? How do you handle it? So I don't know. I mean, you can't come right out and ask that question, I think, in the true sense of the word. But what I think I might ask them is to talk about, like, how is brainstorming handled in the company? How are differing, you know, like things like, like more the process of certain things within, you know, because that's where the conflict comes in. Role expectations, um, you know, idea generation, uh, execution, all of, I mean, think about really where conflict comes into play. Um, you know, you could talk about how do you, you know, how do you do a, you know, I, I'm big on the, um, on design thinking is a big thing that I do. So, you know, talking about like how, what's the process, you know, if you're looking at new products or services, you know, how do the, how do people, uh, how does your company handle that? Um, what if there's, a, and then if they say, well, we do this, this, and this, then you could kind of follow up and say, well, how do you handle uh, differing opinions on things like this? You know, and you could say, you know, conflict is, you know, can be very helpful in situations like this. How is that handled? So I think if you start off not asking the question bluntly, ask another question first and then build on it probably is a better way to handle it. Yeah, well, I, I very much like your dichotomy of functional versus dysfunctional conflict. They are different. Mm -hmm. And that'd be the first question I would ask if someone asked me about how I handled conflict. Right. Well, that's if she's being asked the question, but to ask the interviewer, I think I would rather, you know, especially if you pick up on things too, and there again, high emotional intelligence, like if they're talking about another person on the team, 
you know, maybe you're, you're asking them about, could you explain more about each team member and how they work together, you know, or something like that. You can kind of pick up, like, if they look like, like they don't like the person, you know, their facial expressions or whatever, or they don't say a lot about one person, <laughs> say glowing things about another person, you know, you could pick up on things that way too. You know, I think you're, you know, you brought up this point about the water cooler. We're, we're, we don't have as much knowledge about the people we're working with when we're working remotely. There were, you know, the side conversations at the coffee machine were invaluable to understanding people and what they might react to. It might, the conversations might have been totally not about business, but we're losing that right now. And the thing is, is that, I mean, ideally you would like everyone to leave their baggage, their spouses, their kids, the dog in the car when they get into the building. This is when you're in face to face. But obviously, as you just said, you know, the personal life sometimes comes into the professional life as much as you would not like it to. But now when you're working remotely, you may not be picking up on all that stuff unless the family comes into the, you know, comes into your Zoom call, which has happened. You may have absolutely no way of knowing. Right. So you could be, you know, talking about something. Actually, yesterday I was, we were in training and I got a text message during break about one of my students who has, has to have surgery. And I got a little emotional when I, because we were talking about the definition of success <coughs> of showing, you know, caring for other people and, and, you know, all of that. And all of a sudden I, I kind of welled up a little bit. So again, there's a trigger too. So you have to, you, you really do have to think about how, and I know we're running out of time, you know, yeah. not only your perception of yourself, but again, the perception that others have of you. And then think about people that you do get along with, going back to Lisa's question, and the people that you don't necessarily get along with. And think about how that works, too. Yeah, there was a great book. I, I didn't read it, but uh, the title was How to Get Along with People You Can't Stand. There's another great book called, um, I don't have it in front of me. It's called Difficult Conversations. It's a purple book. That's a really good one, too. Yeah, oh, there's, there's something about everything. You just type it into Google. So I will offer to everyone, if you'd like to send me a LinkedIn invite, you're more than welcome to. Um, I haven't been blogging recently. We're actually taking a bunch of my blogs and turning it into an ebook. I'll let Matt know when that's, it's just gonna be a free ebook that we're gonna be sending out. You're more than pleased to promote it, Beth. You've you. given us so much editorial content over the years. And I enjoy every one of your articles. I don't know how you can come up with something for every letter of the alphabet. I have to tell you, it keeps me on track. That's why right now I'm not blogging because I do much better when I know that I have 26 letters of the alphabet to work with. So that's why I do it that way. I actually have a whiteboard with 26 stickies. And as I read things or whatever, I start putting words down and then I do my next round of blogs. Yeah, I once asked uh, Joe Conley of uh, CBS News. Uh, how, he was at a meeting I attended and I asked him, how he came up with what he was going to talk about. And he looked at me like nobody had ever asked him that before. He, he absolutely couldn't figure out, he couldn't think of what to say. And he came up to me like 10 minutes later and he explained it to me. Interesting. It was fascinating. I have, very, I have great interest in how people come up with ideas and how they process them. Well, wait till you see my next series. I haven't figured that out yet. So the other thing I'll just- I, yeah. I say that too. I can't wait to see what I'm going to write about. <laughs> um, I keep saying I'm going to do a real book and that hasn't happened. Um, ah, don't do a real book. Waste of time. So I, <laughs> I'm sure we, we can impose on Beth to answer a few more questions. Uh, we've, we've covered our hour and I do try to end my meetings on time as well as start them on time. But uh, any other questions? We've, we've had some wine raging discussions and uh, covered a lot of important topics. But I would encourage you to do that quiz. Even if you're like, ah, it's a waste of my time. Just try it. What do you got to lose? You might learn something about yourself. So the link is in the chat. Okay. Well, if nobody has any other questions, uh, we're going to end the meeting. Uh, Beth, I want to thank you for coming uh, on Chat with Matt. Uh, uh, the purpose of uh, Chat with Matt, as I said, is to uh, come up with people who, are, who have something interesting to say. Uh, I hope all, I haven't, uh, I don't know that I have anything scheduled in the next week, but uh, we, I will have more of these and uh, I look forward to having these kinds of discussions. I think they're much more important, much more uh, entertaining than death by PowerPoint. So that's why I do these. Uh, we're, we have our new website. I assume all of you have been out to it and 
If you're having any issues uh, utilizing this great resource that I spent more money on than a drunken sailor, I do hope you'll call me. Uh, I'm happy to explain any of the uh, uh, issues with the website. And of course, uh, if, you're, if you have a few extra bucks loose uh, and you wanna make a donation, there is an easy way to do that on our website. And I would ask you to help support our efforts. So I'm gonna leave you with, uh, thank you for uh, coming to chat with Matt and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care and uh, Beth, again, thank you so very much for joining us on Chat with Matt. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matt. Thanks again for having me. You're welcome.